see you. Good. Good to see you. It's been forever, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Yes, it has. Oh, gosh. Hello, friends. Oh, my gosh, there's Debbie. Hi, Hi how are good you? Morning. Good morning. It's so nice to see people. You know, someday we're actually, uh, you know, going to wonder if we recognize people when we see them in the flesh, you know. <laughs> okay, I'm going to give it one more minute and then we're going to start. Okay. People can catch up. Yeah, the biggest problem about seeing people after a year or so of not seeing people is that any number of us may very well have put on a little extra uh, flesh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is possible. It is possible. Or our hair has gotten a little bit whiter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And there are Gwen and Charlie. That's great. We're coming along here, getting there. Okay, so I want to welcome everyone to this uh, Hot Topic session and remind you that um, if you're not a member, you can always become one. We look forward to you, even though we're called the League of Women Voters, we've got men on our rolls and we'd like to have more of them. And uh, before, um, we have our speaker introduction and uh, she begins to share her view, her life with us since it's secret. I want, uh, and I want you to uh, turn this over to Debbie Gold. She's got some things to say that are important. Debbie? Hi, um, as many of you know, I'm chairing the State Advocacy Committee and so we certainly look at a lot of the bills that come up and I'll be the, in the state legislature. And of course, there's no one who can address all of them. It's a little overwhelming when it, the legislature is in session. But we are concerned about one in particular that I think you all have heard about. And I just wanted to get just a brief statement about a uh, resolution um, HR 23 that came out. So um, this is not fine tuned yet, but we certainly will be sending some message about this to the state, uh, to the committee that will be hearing this issue. Okay, coming week. So I just would like to read a brief Please. statement. Um, the League of Women Voters has long advocated for policies and practices that promote a fair, partial, and independent judiciary as fundamental to the principles of our democratic republic. Yeah based on the separation of powers and the rule of law. Judicial independence means that members of the judiciary must be able to do their work without undue political pressure from one or more political parties, partisan leaders, donor entities, or private citizens. Judges must be free to decide cases before them based on the facts and the law without consideration of any political consequences or potential retribution. Upholding these principles of judicial independence is particularly important as judges often are required to decide disputes that raise significant matters of public debate or controversy. The Tennessee legislature is currently discussing one such case. Last year, Chancellor Lyle ruled in a hearing related to absentee voting. It required her judicial interpretation of certain rights and responsibilities under the state's administration of election law. Her decision was then subject to a full judicial review by the Tennessee Supreme Court, which reversed the decision. The League of Women Voters of Tennessee believes that the effort to remove Chancellor Lyle based on a decision she issued as a sitting judge, sets a very dangerous precedent for Tennessee. If resolution HR 23 moves forward, judges everywhere would have to consider whether their judicial decision based on the law, 
and facts could subject them to a removal by the legislature. Such a result would turn on its head the very notion of separation of powers and the role of an independent judiciary. For this re reason, the League of Women Voters of Tennessee strenuously opposes H.R. 23. Thank you. Are you sending that, Debbie? I will, we will send out, it's perhaps may need a little bit of fine tuning, but we will send it out, yes. The sooner the better. Yes. So uh, that was all I needed to say at this point. Thank you. Carol, you work. want to introduce? I, I think we're ready, Claudia. Are we ready? All right. Okay. I am delighted to introduce, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a retired chancellor from our court system, Claudia Bonneman, who has been retired um, a little over a year now. And I think she's enjoying being retired. And one of the things that she's done is join the League of Women Voters. So we have a member who's going to be speaking to us. She received her law degree from Vanderbilt in 1974, where she also was awarded the Order of the Coif. Claudia was a partner with the Nashville firm of Ortel and Kelly, Herbert and Crawford, and um, was in private practice. While in private practice, she received the Vanderbilt Equity uh, Award from the nonprofit Weave. In 1981, she was founding member of the Lawyers Association for Women and has served as its first pre president. In 1989, she was appointed clerk and master for the Chancery Court, and in 2003, um, when one of the judges stepped down, she was appointed by Governor Bredesen to serve as Chancellor for Part 1 of the 20th Judicial District of Nashville. We are delighted to have her. She uh, has been involved in all kinds of different things. She's a fellow of the Nashville Bar. She is a member of the Tennessee Bar Foundation, as well as a member of the uh, Women, the Lawyers Association for Women that she started. She was awarded the Martha Craig Daughtry Award from the um, Lawyers Association for Women in 1981, which is the I'm sorry, 2018, uh, which is the highest award that they offer people. So um, she's married to um, Gordon Bonneman, who was the founder of the nonprofit Tennessee Justice System. She has a long history of being involved in human rights issues and um, has a son that's a doctor in New Orleans. With that introduction, I'm going to say this is a woman who has worn many hats who has a tremendous amount of information to share with us about all that goes on under the great black robe. How's that? <laughs> That's excellent, Carol. <laughs> thank you for those kind words. And thank you to the League of Women Voters for inviting me to speak today. When I came home from a walk with a League member, Pat Post, this morning, I brushed my hair, I put on earrings, and I searched around for makeup which I could not find, but uh, it felt so good and feels so good to move into normalcy in this time of COVID. Uh, it was my privilege to serve as a judge in the Chancery Court of Tennessee for 15 years. These were the best years of my law practice because the ambiguity and richness of life passed before me every day. I saw early on, however, that the general public is somewhat misled about what judges do. Today, I will wade into the debate over whether judges are umpires or activists. I'll explain how it is that some high profile cases are not decided on their merits, but for procedural reasons that serve other justice values. Since many of you have judges in your family and among your friends, I will examine the mistakes that I made when I took judging home with me. I'll talk about the importance of a legal system in enabling us to all live together peaceably, but also the inability of the courts to solve many of the problems that people bring to judges. I'll talk about the handful of cases I learned to dread and the many more cases that made me love the job of being a judge. Mm -hmm. I want to acknowledge my debt to the league, to our founder, Carrie Chapman, Chapman Catt, and to the many women who labored to win passage of the 19th Amendment and to fight the later battles that won opportunities for women like me. My father, grandfather, and great-grandfather were all lawyers, and I grew up hearing 
or my family that I or my sisters might entertain the possibility of becoming lawyers. Only after I married a law student did that suddenly seem like an option for me. I was fortunate to have women friends only a few years older than I who experienced sexism and withstood professional discrimination in the field of the practice of law to open doors for me and for other women. First, some background about the courts. The Chancery Court, where I spent 15 years, is a civil trial court. It's not a court that trials in, tries individuals for criminal offenses. However, some issues of prisoner rights are decided in Chancery, including the constitutionality of how an inmate on death row is executed. Judges who try lawsuits do not have a say about which cases are assigned to them. This is also true of the Tennessee Court of Appeals, who provide the first review of a civil trial judge's work. The highest courts, however, such as the Tennessee Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court, choose from among the cases on appeal, applying broad principles which call for their common sense and good judgment. It's entirely within the U.S. Supreme Court's discretion whether to accept or decide an appeal. Some reasons to accept a case for review by the U.S. Supreme Court include whether the case has national significance, now that's somewhat subjective, and whether the law should be clarified, which is also somewhat subjective. I presided over hundreds of hearings over 15 years. Although most of these cases did not have a high profile, the disputes mattered a great deal to the individuals who were involved and to me. For example, on one particular day, I issued an order limiting a dentist's right to practice dentistry because he had been grossly negligent in treating children who were on Medicaid, and that violated the standards of his profession. On the same day, I prevented a bank from forcing the immediate sale of a person's home due to a mortgage debt until a hearing to address the mortgage terms and whether there was actually a default could take place. These cases did not appear in any newspaper or internet post, but their stories about the human condition. While I served on the bench, I felt useful because some of these part of their disputes. Ultimately, that is what the courts are for, providing a means for the nonviolent resolution of human conflict and so doing to apply rules that govern how we live together. In addition to the resolution of disputes that went unnoticed by the general public, I heard a number of high profile oh, matters about which the press and the public heard a good bit. In a lawsuit the national media referred to as Jeez. the guns and bars case, I was asked to avoid a law allowing customers to carry their guns into bars. Unless the bar owner posted a sign prohibiting customers from bringing in guns, the statute, this new statute, gave customers the right to carry a gun, provided they did not drink while in the bar. Well, why did they come into the bar, you have to ask. Uh, if revenue, on the other hand, uh, our legislature had provided that it was fine to pack heat and drink yes. if you were in a restaurant. Mm -hmm. The law distinguished between a restaurant and a bar. If revenue came mostly from food, it was a restaurant and the customer could carry a gun and drink. If the business didn't sell a certain amount of food, did not enjoy alcohol while on those premises. Around the world, the Tennessee law was described as an example of our legislator's zeal to promote gun rights. I mean, our country's zeal, perhaps at the expense of public safety or common sense. A group of restaurant operators and gun owners filed suit to have the statute declared unconstitutional. They said, there's no practical way for a customer to know what percentage of an establishment sales were for food versus alcohol, and therefore no way to know if there are Plaintiffs argued that the law was unconstitutionally vague. They asked for an injunction, that is an order saying stop what you're doing to keep the law from taking effect. And an injunction is sought most commonly at the very beginning of a lawsuit. A problem, however, was that a civil court cannot enjoin the enforcement of criminal law. That has to go up through the criminal process. I therefore lacked authority and found that the court could not bar the law from taking effect. A BBC World News reporter wrongly described a Tennessee judge, me, as having endorsed the law. Just another wild-eyed Tennessee gun enthusiast. 
In fact, I had only acknowledged the limits of my authority, which are just very, very clear issue. The case continued to judgment and ultimately I found the statute fatally flawed because of vagueness. The Tennessee Attorney General did not appeal that ruling. I hope I don't disappoint any of my league friends because you can't take your gun with you into a bar. Uh, another controversial case involved an effort to hold a referendum on whether to require that all official government business in Davidson County be conducted in English only. The proponents had submitted their petition to add the issue to the ballot shortly before a major election. The Metro government and claiming the petition had been submitted one day after the filing deadline that was established by law. I determined that the law establishing that timeline, the deadline permitted no exceptions. I therefore barred the English only question from being voted on at the upcoming election. Both supporters and opponents of the referendum thought I was guided by my view of the merits because I had so many people come up to me and say, thank you. And I really appreciated that because we don't get much feedback, but it was really not, not accurate, not accurate way to see what was going on. Actually, I was only applying the procedural rule that required a certain amount of advance notice before a measure could be voted on. There was no question that the proponents had gathered way more than the required number of signatures to get a vote on the proposal. They felt they'd been cheated by the court's use of what they saw as a mere technicality. Such legal technicalities usually exist to serve larger purposes that transcend the immediate lawsuit. And these, these legal technicalities are vital to justice and the rule of law. In that case, that is the English only case, what may have seemed like the strict adherence to time limits, that is to ensure that the public can have firm expectations about legal deadlines. In this case, the filing deadline was there to make sure that opponents of a ballot initiative aren't ambushed on the eve of an election and to give voters enough time to hear the arguments on both sides before they go to the polls. In this case, that is the English only case, the effect of my decision uh, promoted just that value. The English only group gathered signatures a second time and then succeeded in having the issue placed on the ballot at a later election. Davidson County voters voted it down by a substantial margin. Pundits and leaders on both sides of the issue agreed that the English only uh, issue would have likely passed had I allowed it to remain on the ballot the way in, the opponents had enough time to mount a widespread education campaign that turned Nashvilleians against the measure. The mayor technicality had served its important person of giving the community a chance to vet whatever it is that they're being asked to vote on. Here's a short list of some other high profile lawsuits assigned to me. I refer to these by the primary question to be resolved because this is how judges summarize in their minds about what the lawsuit's about. One case I had, can operators of private prisons keep the records of their operation secret? Can the state hide the identity of someone it has hired to execute prisoners? Do the poisons used by the state to execute prisoners inflict needlessly cruel and unusual punishment prohibited under our constitutions? Whether an inmate in a prison is entitled to some sort of review or hearing before being labeled as a gang member? Whether the owner of a lot in the floodplain of this county After 2010, judge decide disputes that arise among the church members in spite of the First Amendment, which protects the free exercise of religion. In light of Metro, and this is a, an old case because things have changed as they always do, but in light of Metro zoning regulations, which prohibit housing barnyard animals in the city, can a Nashville homeowner avoid these zoning regulations by showing that the chickens she is raising in her yard are her pets rather than barnyard animals. And I saw I saw Stuart Clifton in the uh, audience when the chicken case was argued. And um, I saw a number of, of people who like me 
would be happy to have chickens in our backyard. So I'm not gonna turn the secrets of judges into the business of judging. Secret number one, a judge is not an umpire. The landing page of the US court's website quotes Chief Justice John Roberts at his confirmation hearing. Judges and justices are servants of the law, not the other way around. Judges are like umpires. Umpires don't make the rules, they apply them. The role of an umpire and judge is critical. They make sure everybody plays by the rules, but it is a limited role. And this is what Justice Roberts had to say. He then discussed at his confirmation hearing, his high value for the rule of law. And he sums up with the promise, I will remember that it is my job to call balls and strikes and not to pitch or bat. The truth is that judges and lawyers know that umpire is a poor metaphor for a judge. The term umpire is designed to assure a governor or panel who will appoint a judge that the applicant will not establish policy or disrespect the work of the legislative and executive branches. The use of the term umpire is so prevalent that several law review articles are devoted to this controversial subject. And I might add, the only apt baseball metaphor is that a judge who will decide a case must never wear the uniform of any party in the case. That is, the judge must not show up for just one side of the lawsuit. As Judge McKee of the Third Circuit Court of Appeals has written, the metaphor of umpire is helpful if it conveys the idea that judges' decisions will be guided by legal principles rather than an agenda or a personal view of policy. However, he observes, the umpire metaphor obscures a complex dynamic that is more amorphous, elusive, and troublesome than the term umpire conveys. Judges have to manage unforeseen situations by exercising discretion and judgment in ways that are foreign to the ball field. Judges may not be able to decide cases based on the objective application of a set of rules as an umpire does. For starters, judge, judges often disagree about what rules should apply, something about which there is never any question in baseball. Which brings me to another important example of how a judge is not an umpire. The complexity of rules applied by judges is such that even a diligent person who is without a lawyer cannot understand how to apply them. Access to judges, judges, justice is the biggest gap between the justice to which our society aspires and the justice that is actually available. And it's a problem that judges struggle to address. An umpire has no authority to deviate from the rules and level the playing field based on the circumstances. By contrast, even though there is generally no right to a lawyer in civil cases, a judge has the authority to take some action to try to afford the unrepresented individual a chance. This includes the unusual step of finding a volunteer lawyer for a party who stands to lose a valuable right and who cannot possibly defend those rights. A judge has inherent authority to recognize and manage fairness issues that are not addressed in the rules. And here I want to recognize and thank our league member, Susan Matson because she was the go-to person for Chancery Court, for us four chancellors, when the Comptroller's Office was trying to measure the work that judges do. And the only way anybody could figure out to do that is by the time it takes to accomplish a certain task. You can imagine how very difficult that was, but it is, it's a good goal. I mean, we should be able to measure what judges do so we know how many judges do we need. And is this judge spending the right amount of time at the judges you know, on the bench or, or whatever, doing the work that needs to be done? Um, but we went and met with Susan Matson. She immediately understood how complex our jobs are and she would never fall for the idea that a judge is an umpire. So I want to thank Susan Matson. Um, and I'll give you an example of the extraordinary step of finding a volunteer lawyer and you see what you think. about whether this was good judgment. He was appealing denial of unemployment benefits to him after he lost his job. Now that's the Department of Labor is in charge of that. He was an Egyptian immigrant working at a convenience store, waiting on customers behind a counter. His first language was Arabic. He struggled to use English on the job and in the courtroom. It turned out that he worshiped in the Coptic Orthodox Christian Church. 
before he immigrated to the United States, a fact that would prove significant in what happened to him in Tennessee. He had been fired from his job at the convenience store for misconduct and was therefore deemed not to qualify for unemployment benefits. So now the, he's not gonna have any income at all. It was the judge's job to determine if the Department of Labor had reason to decide that the worker had engaged in misconduct or if the denial of benefits was arbitrary, was an arbitrary decision. Waited on a customer. So here's, here's what happened. He waited on a customer and her child whose first language was Spanish. According to all involved, a television newscast had been running behind the counter visible to people in the store. The newscast depicted a Coptic church in Egypt that was burned to the ground by another religious group. The Egyptian worker who had been watching the newscast was accused of threatening the customer, this woman, and her child with the words, Jesus is coming to cut off your heads. And I'm not making this stuff up. Uh, the worker explained to the department of labor that he was a Coptic Christian as a mother and her child, but not to them. Jesus is coming to punish them, meaning the people who had set fire to the church. At the initial hearing before me, the worker stated through an interpreter, I would never say such a thing. Why would I direct such a comment to her? She had nothing to do with it. The employer filed the worker after reviewing a video of the encounter with the woman and her child who only spoke Spanish because the employer also thought, thought that the words were a threat. The lawyer for the Department of Labor did not see the case the way I did, that there may have been miscommunication all the way around. And I therefore could not rely on the employer's description of the threat taken from the video. I had to see the video myself. What, what was I going to see or hear? I was the decision maker at that moment. The video was not filed so the Department of Labor could see it, although they had found his misconduct. And no, neither was it filed in the Chancery Court so that I could determine whether there was misconduct. To address the worker's inability to advocate for himself and also to educate me, which is one of the most important things a lawyer does, that is educate the judge, about this strange situation, I myself called a law firm and asked for a volunteer who would represent the worker. I avoided discussing anything else. I didn't tell them anything about the case. Just here's somebody who needs help. Will you volunteer? I avoided requiring anyone to take such an action and would have to be really careful in doing that. A few days after the lawyer got involved, we learned the case had settled and the worker would get benefits. Some months later at a bar association event, the lawyer I had appointed or asked to get involved came to me and said, the misconduct accusation was dropped as soon as he appeared at the Department of Labor on behalf of the worker, as soon as he walked in. It made me feel good and it made me feel bad, both. Uh, the employer had lost the video and was not able to prove what the worker had said. He couldn't even show what the worker had said because he wasn't there when the statement was made. Based on the circumstances at the workplace and based on the worker's demeanor in court, I believe that as to the benefits, justice was done. He did qualify, or at least the Department of Labor finally decided he did qualify for the benefits. My role as judge made me more than an umpire because I don't know what would have happened if we just proceeded forward. I mean, I can't predict what could have been shown or explained or whatever, but I didn't think much was going to be explained. There are other important reasons why the umpire, umpire metaphor will not work. The metaphor provides the illusion that judges are able to ignore bias and discharge their duties in In a mechanical way. The fact is cultural, religious, and economic forces that shape us as individuals. We may be unaware of the most enduring and powerful social uh, forces that influence us and the mechanical application of rules. We've all seen that. Without deep consideration, compassion, intelligence, empathy, and a sense of history is just scary. 
The term activist judge, which we're hearing a lot about right now, uh, which is used as the antithesis of the neutral umpire is also misleading. A judge is an activist when she rules in a way that someone does not like. There's no agreed upon definition for the term. According to Judge Harry Edwards of the DC Court of Appeals, in all cases, the nature of one's personal beliefs should be conscious. I recently learned about a common bias from a psychology professor at Vanderbilt, and I'm ashamed that I just recently learned of it. According to the science of psychology, we humans are influenced by the halo effect. That is, a good looking person is thought to be a better person than a less attractive person. I thought we were over judging a book by its cover, but this is not so, it's, it is a human problem. I would rather a judge be aware of the halo effect and make the effort to resist possible bias, which by the way, judges do every day, than to appear before a judge who does not consider this bias at all. What if, in reference to bias, what if the pool of judges across the country represented all genders and races and eth ethnic groups so that our subjective beliefs are caused to collide, that is we call each other on them, and to be revealed to ourselves. That would be, I think, a better day. One last observation about and many other judicial candidates who have used the metaphor during confirmation hearings are trying to assure the public and other and officials before they're for whom they're appearing that as judges they only apply the law never make the law but that is false especially as it refers to the u.s supreme court there is a large body of judge-made law known as the common law it developed over centuries in england the practice did and it was imported into the American colonies. It has continued to develop since our independence. It has been compared to a coral reef, which grows slowly by small accretions consisting of hundreds of judicial decisions that become precedents. And just like statutes enacted by Congress guide later judicial decisions. The common law has developed not because judges are activists, but because judges must necessarily fill in the gaps in legislation, regularity is infinitely more complex than a ball game, and very little in life can be completely predicted. There are gaps in our expectations of how we humans will conduct ourselves. The common law is the product of hundreds of years of collective human experience and the distilled wisdom from judges long past who understood that their jobs were to do far more than call balls and strikes. The second secret I want to address is don't try this at home. I've learned the painful lesson that the attributes of a sincere judge can call trouble with relationships. Now, your league president, Madeline Garr, should have come home with me because she has great gifts of empathy and of organization. She would have acted of not make an effort to be right, and she would have been right herself in that regard. So back to the attributes that I was taking home. Those attributes for a judge include being neutral, honoring the truth, asking probing questions, being calm in the face of turmoil, and being reserved and circumspect. In our home, outspoken concern about injustice is common. Discussions of, for example, our healthcare system by our physician son and his father are commonplace and heartfelt. These are serious conversations and they have something to do with the worldview, with worldview and our true selves. My husband admits that he is often wrong, but seldom in doubt. For a while, I tried to bring my, bring my best judging skills to these conversations. My typical questions might look like, what about the other side? Is it fair to make the assumptions that you two are making? Doesn't the newspaper article you are praising seem one-sided and biased? I was bringing my judicial wisdom to the conversation, looking for the whole story, for the facts that would reveal the truth. My, fam my family advised pointedly that the detached response to others' passion is obnoxious. The judge who is a family member should be on the family friendships 
Our friends are not asking for our judgment and our diagnosis, but for our, but for our support. This insight from my son Houston and Gordon helped me protect my dear relationships. With this insight from my family, I changed the setting for rulings to focus more on the feelings of the parties and lawyers and a little less on ruling as soon as the hearing ended, which I might add is not an easy thing to do. It takes hours to come up with a decision, but the litigants are nervous and they want a, a A prompt hearing, a prompt result. There are stronger values. I no longer issued the ruling in the courtroom with the involved people present, but I emailed the oral dictation to the lawyers a few days later so they could wince in privacy and decide how to convey the ruling to their clients. Although I had to be neutral and detached to reach a fair decision, I learned to keep my detachment, I hope, from wounding the feelings of the parties who felt wronged and wanted me to embrace their cause. Last, the judging approach, rational and evidence-based, can distract from the best life has to offer. The judicial system cannot operate without honesty and a quest for the truth, but the matters which we most value cannot be seen and they cannot be measured. Love, faith, loyalty, empathy, and mercy are examples. A person who devalues these immeasurable and priceless aspects of life starves the soul. As for secret number three, the room where it happens isn't necessarily the courtroom. Books, news media, and movies depicting judges invariably focus on their role in the courtroom, presiding over trials or hearing appellate arguments, but the courtroom is not where judges do some of their most important work and isn't where most lawsuits get resolved. Judges are called on throughout pretrial process to resolve disputes about discovery or make legal rulings that decide some issues in the case. Through this process, the parties to the lawsuit learn about the strengths and weaknesses of their own case and of their adversary's case. Increasingly, parties will seek the services of a professional mediator to help them settle their differences by agreement. Once they have a clear picture of the strength of their own and their adversary's case, most lawyers have a pretty fair idea of the range of possible outcomes. Judges encourage settlement, encourage settlement and occasionally even require the parties to mediate before setting the case for trial. That's because the parties are generally more satisfied with a resolution they negotiate than one that's imposed upon them by the court in a decision. None of this important pretrial activity makes for dramatic television and little of it occurs in the courtroom, but it leads to the settlement or other disposition of 90% of civil cases without a full-blown trial. Overseeing and managing this process is a vital part of the job, even if it occurs mostly off camera. Secret number four, judges have their passions too. We judges strive to appear dispassionate and rational, rational, but we each have strong feelings about the types of cases that we love and the ones that we hate. The cases I hated the most, I never expected to end up in a civil court. Those were cases of Tennessee's death penalty. Several condemned prisoners, I think there were 30 of them, filed suit challenging the written protocol, directing the method by which they would be executed. Not whether they would be executed, but the way in which they'd be executed. And the case was randomly assigned to me. I was pretty miserable, but after struggling with my conscience, I concluded that I had to keep the case, regardless of my deeply held conviction that the death penalty is inherently immoral and unwise, though not illegal. in our current time in this state because judges are to acknowledge and apply the law as the Supreme Court interprets it. That was my job and I could not pass the buck. The first death penalty lawsuit assigned to me challenged Tennessee's serial use of three drugs to put a condemned person to death. After a trial with many witnesses, I found that the manner of using the drugs was indeed cruel because the first drug paralyzed the individual, rendering him unable to signal that he was in pain while the third drug stopped his heart. The second drug would supposedly render him unconscious before the heart, uh, the attack on the heart. Uh, and, but I found that the, but the proof, proof was inadequate to assure that the inmate was not aware of what was happening to him. I concluded on the strength of the evidence presented that the three drug, drug method was unconstitutional because 
the inmate might be conscious but paralyzed and unable to signal pain. This ruling made some people furious. The Tennessean printed angry letters to the editor from supporters of the death penalty. My husband warned me not to read the comments and I didn't. Unfortunately, he did, conveying the tenor of the comments by quoting one reader who wrote, Bonnieman ought to be fed into a tree shredder. The next few comments were missing and had to be and had been replaced by the editor's notice. These comments had been deleted for failure to comply with the Tennessean's code of civility. civility. If the tree shredder comment complied with the paper civility standards, we were glad not to know the nature of the omitted comments. While my ruling was on appeal, the state changed the protocol and the Tennessee Supreme Court directed me to examine the new protocol. I had to conclude that the new protocol was no longer cruel and unusual under the standards set by the Supreme Court. I was relieved that no execution took place as the case moved through the appellate courts. Years later, Tennessee again changed the execution protocol. This time the state planned to use a single drug to kill the condemned person. After a second lengthy trial, I had to conclude that the prisoners were unable to prove that the drug, which is used in Oregon for assisted suicide, would inflict gratuitous pain. Under Supreme Court precedent, I upheld the protocol, which has since been used to carry out several execu executions. I agree, as Albert Camus wrote, that a cruelty inherent in capital punishment is that the inmate knows for months or years the date and hour of his death. While these cases were tried, I recognized that the inmate would be killed and that I had a role in the death. A friend advised that resigning my position as judge would be a moral way to protest the death penalty, but that would resolve only part of the problem. For example, who would take my place and what would they think about any of these issues? If judges refuse to apply the law when they disagree with it, those judges dishonor the rule of law, a great strength of this country and required for a democracy. On the other hand, at what point must the judiciary say enough? I learned to dread another very different type of case. Surprisingly, that is the land boundary case, which turns on the dry testimony of land surveyors. But emotions usually run high with warring neighbors feeling that differences of even a few feet in the location of a property line place their homes and their identities in jeopardy. In the most tragic boundary case that was assigned to me, an inherently tense conflict was made much worse by the fact that the older of the two next door neighbors was mentally ill and aggressive. The young neighbor's father in his 60s appeared on the site with a pistol to protect his son. He was shot to death by the older neighbor. Immediately overcome by remorse, the shooter told his wife that he would kill himself over what he had done, and he did kill himself a few hours later. All of this escalated as I tried unsuccessfully to lower the tensions. Should I have foreseen this violence and what else could I have done? I learned as a judge that I could not prevent a tragedy, but these tragedies did occur on my watch. Lawsuits brought by church members against their church or their pastor are another type of tough case where emotions run high and the judge is unable to resolve the case in a way that can satisfy the litigants. That's because a judge is constrained by the First Amendment prohibition against government institutions, including the courts, interfering with the free exercise of religion. The parties in church lawsuits are almost always disappointed by the court's inability to resolve, much less heal, the strife that is tearing the church apart. Litigation just tends to intensify the divisions. When Gordon and I were on sabbatical years ago, we worked in Jerusalem. While there, we visited the Church of the Holy Sepulchre on numerous occasions, where Jesus was reputedly buried and rose from the dead. Numerous Christian sects have long quarreled and fought over which group controlled which part of the venerated church. Gordon and I were openly, though privately, disdainful of the strife surrounding that church. Walter Harrelson, who some of you may have known, a Vanderbilt theologian who was teaching there on sabbatical at the time, gently reminded us that the reason there's so much strife in churches is because the people care so much. I was reminded of that insight as I presided over litigation brought by disaffected church members against the Two Rivers Baptist Church, a megachurch located near Opry Mills in Nashville. 
Most church lawsuits arise from something a pastor or church elder has said or done or will do that leads to litigation within a congregation. And the Two Rivers Baptist case was just such a case. A faction of the church congregation disapproved of the pastor's use of church funds that they felt was personal, unauthorized use. There was high emotion in that lawsuit, which made it difficult to manage. When a hearing was scheduled in the case, contending factions of congregants packed the courtroom to overflowing. The Supreme Court's First Amendment decisions hold that trial judges may adjudicate neutral disputes not involving uh, religious belief or religious leadership. Uh, they can resolve disputes involving, for example, a church's property, such as contract to buy property or sell property, uh, issues with vendors, and even some employment contracts with staff. But most other church disputes are beyond the court's jurisdiction. This includes controversial actions of the pastor and governing elders generally considered to involve the exercise of religion. It is these disputes that most often cause bitter feelings. I rule that the complaining members of Two Rivers were entitled to the church's financial records as a matter of law and statute so they could see how the church is being run. But I had no authority to resolve the conflict over the pastor and his activities. Sadly, the church's division deepened, the church community fell apart, friendships were destroyed and its enormous buildings and campus were sold. Another type of case involved a foretaste of the sort of anti-government extremism that is now so much with us. More than a decade ago, courts started seeing cases that involved litigants who belong to an extreme fringe movement referring to themselves as sovereign citizens. They don't have lawyers, they always represent themselves. They assert they don't need a lawyer because they're answerable only to God and legitimate government as defined by themselves. They deny that any government has jurisdiction over them and they make use of the courts to harass government agencies, but refuse to follow court rules or any laws to which they objected. One such case involved a builder of a large house in Nashville. His wife taught in the public schools, and of course they used city services, but he refused to pay taxes or pay for city services such as water and sewer. The city sued to collect property taxes and hours were required to manage the formulaic internet sourced papers filed in the dispute. The sovereign citizens tested patience, everybody's patience, but the only course was to treat the builder with respect in spite of his contempt for society and for the very legal system that he was exploiting. As fringe groups have grown, so too have the number of sovereign citizen cases which seek to undermine the rule of law. Happily, the cases that instilled dread were few and on most days I was very grateful for my job. Judging constantly engaged my mind. Like you, I aspire to be a life lifelong learner. Uh, this subject certainly makes me think about one of your members, Claire Sullivan. She is a lifelong learner who I admire and she uses her knowledge base to make the world a better place. I mean, she definitely has done that. For example, about unexpected topics. Commercial disputes frequently educated me about occupations and industries vital to our society that I had not known existed. In one such case, two businesses have competed for a government highway construction contract to manufacturing to manufacturing gabions. Gabions are wild wire boxes engineered to hold heavy weights, usually rocks. Loaded, the boxes are installed as retaining walls along highways or at the base of pillars bracing a bridge. The gabions prevent erosion and strengthen bridges. I had never heard of gabions when I got this lawsuit, but I learned how to evaluate their strength as compared to the industry standards because the lawyers educated me to that information. Um, the purpose of the lawsuit was that the parties had both bid on a government job to build a bridge the winner had misrepresented the, that his uh, gabions met industry standards and he got the bid. So the losing party sued on the basis of unfair and illegal competition. The loser of the bid won the case and got damages against the, the person who was able to be shown had been dishonest in his bid. The cases I love the most 
were ones that engaged my heart as well as my mind. Among those were petitions for name changes, which some judges labeled humdrum clerical functions. Name changes, however, brought me joy every day. When adults change their name, there's real purpose in it. The law is simple, but the human drama is often poignant. Except for persons who are guilty of certain felonies or have an ulterior, ulterior uh, illegal purpose, an adult can have whatever name she wants. Before the same gender couples had the right to marry, some men and women changed their last names to their sweethearts' last names. It was somewhat akin to creating a family. On one occasion years before, the Supreme Court recognized the right of same gender couples to marry when a man saw that I was approving his name change without hesitation, he removed a wedding ring from his pocket for his partner who had come with him to the hearing. The hundreds of poignant cases that stand out in my memory included changing the name of an immigrant child so that other people could pronounce his name, changing names to reflect gender reassignment after surgery, a young adult's request to change his name to honor the stepfather he loved, a young adult's request to change from his biological father's name to the last name of the mother who had raised him on her own, changing the demeaning name on a birth certificate of male baby, which designated a baby abandoned at birth, to a dignified name reflecting the person's individuality, an order that finally relieved a person of a humiliating name. This being Nashville, name changes to advance a career in music and theater, changing first names to honor a grandmother or grandfather, obtaining a new name to escape a, a stalker, changing names to disengage from abusive relatives, a name changed by a groom to take his bride's last name. I had the honor of providing the first birth certificate for a man of 30 who could not work without a social security number and could not get a social security number without a birth certificate. He was born at home to a mother who did not certify or record his birth. This young man's entire community drove from Memphis to Nashville to testify about when and how he was born. He was a lovely man who had a difficult start in life, a common theme in name changes. And as for my last story, I had the honor of or enabling uh, Gertrude Short to vote. Ms. Short could not find a birth certificate in the state records. She was an elderly African-American woman who had lived much of her life in the shadow of Jim Crow. She had never been able to vote because the name by which she had been known all through her life was not the name on the birth certificate, nor did she have the names of her parents in the way that they appeared on the birth certificate. So you see, she had a number of problems in trying to find that document. She had made an effort to trace her birth records, but she'd reached a dead end. A heroic volunteer in the courthouse heard about her dilemma and finally located her birth certificate. The order I signed formally changed her name so she could qualify for a social security number and ultimately a voter registration card. Ms. Short and her great niece cried. We all did. This energy, the energy this determined African-American woman brought to this problem was impressive and it was fueled by her, her wish at the age of 88 to help Barack Obama become president. So I've shared with you some thoughts or secrets that sitting judges will not share and probably should not. I have not spoken today yet about the people in Chancery who supported me and the justice system with their loyalty, insight, intelligence, and hard work. Given the isolation that judges experience, and I did too, um, your staff becomes your family and I'm blessed to know them. So thank you, uh, Carol, for asking me to speak and to the league for allowing me to have all this time. And I don't know if you have time for questions, but I'll, I'm, I'm here to address anything that's interesting for you. Let me begin by saying thank you, Claudia, so very much. What a great, great uh, story you told us. It was just, it was such that I would love it if you wrote it up and it got published somewhere. That was really just incredibly engaging. Um, there are always questions. We've got about five minutes, I think. So if people have questions and have not put them in the chat box yet, and would just like to speak them, put yourself on mute and please move forward and do that. And I will check the chat box too. Claudia, just, uh, just as a question, a general question, as you observe the, um, the, 
the way we talk about judges in the public space, what would you suggest should change in terms of giving them a better understanding of the limitations that judges have? And how do we communicate that to the media and others who, who don't seem to understand it themselves? I think one thing I would say now, I, I understand why people who want to be a judge take the position that they do so as not to disturb anybody. But I think the public should know that one attribute of a good judge would be a person who can see that their biases out there all around us and the judge is not exempt from those biases and will work hard to overcome them and will work hard to understand them. And I think the person's life might show a voter, for example, is this person someone who has lived a life that would uh, combat the negative biases that we have? Of course, there's some biases we have that probably are good for society, but most on the bench are probably not. So I would say you can say a lot about an attribute of judges by including in those attributes the fact that the person needs to have an ability to rise above their own flaws. We all have plenty of them. But is there a label to put on a person, like umpire, like a shorthand term for judge? I can't think of one. We Anyone. have a couple of questions for you. Um, Debbie right. asks, can you comment on HR 23? And I think lots of us would like to have your thoughts on that. <laughs> well, first of all, Ellen Lyle uh, was a colleague for many years. I do not think this controversy is personal as to her. Everybody's talked about what a good judge she is, and that is a fact. She's a very, she's excellent. Um, but the real issue is that the ruling was not welcome. The ruling that she announced in court and which was reversed was not welcome. And you know, there were people upset with me, gosh, every day, every day, because someone is strongly opposing what the winner has been able to accomplish. And um, so I think the resolution is, as the bar associations have noted, and I'm a member of the bar associations and agree with it, it is a very bad precedent to try to remove somebody who happened to be wrong. And our, our constitution allows the removal of people and the, the people I remember who were removed had <laughs> committed crimes, had actually committed crimes sexual in nature. That's just for starters. It doesn't happen very often because a judge who gets in trouble will usually resign. But if they have to be removed, it has to be a very serious and wrongful behavior. Ann Carr asks you this question. Do you think the judiciary, state and federal, has become more politicized in the past decade? It appears to be more partisan. Uh, political, you know, we're all swimming in a political world. It's, it's just, uh, so I have a hard time with that term, but I, I know what you mean. Are people more partisan? Um, you know, I did not see that in the state judiciary. There are over a hundred judges in this state. Trial level, there, there, there's more than that, but there at least they're a little over a hundred. And somebody got on the bench. It does appear that there is some is some partisan movement, but let's remember that judges, and this, I love this, judges across the country, almost without exception, rejected the effort to declare this, uh, the election for president uh, to be the result of fraud. There were, maybe there was one judge who said, well, gee, this, maybe this happened, but judges across the country said, show me the proof, 
show us the proof. Of course, you can allege that. Now, where is the proof? And those were Trump appointees and those were uh, Obama appointees and probably older too, I'm sure. But um, that's a good sign. You know, the, the fence got shaken or the wall got shaken and it did fall down. Very good observation. Thank you. Our time is up. Um, let me suggest that we all applaud for a distance here. Uh, loved having you. And I applaud the league. Great organization. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for sharing your, your insight, your knowledge, and your wisdom with us. Great. All right. See you next time. have a good day. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <Not> you, <Ellen. laughs> Sorry.